Um, before we get into a lot of the details, I think it would be great for both film teams to just give the super macro 35,000 foot view of exactly what they've been doing the last year uh, distributing these films. So Jen, why don't you just take a couple minutes and, and talk through all the distribution and then we'll dive into the details. The whole thing. Um, well, thanks so much for having us here today. And I, I think um, the important, you know, every film is unique. Um, and I think the, what was unusual about this film is in some ways distribution began um, before we even started making it. So um, before we started shooting, we had a very large Kickstarter campaign that ended up um, raising over $212,000 for about 2,500 backers. And so we came to the festival with um, an audience that we had been talking to for four years. And so in many cases, we knew where they lived, we knew um, how they connected to the story and why. Um, and uh, we had some very clear ideas about how we wanted to bring the film to them, in particular because much of the audience is um, homebound or bedridden, um, and, and as well as how we wanted to use the film as a tool for community organizing and impact. So those were ideas that we were really kind of building alongside our audience over the course of making the film. Um, and then we premiered at Sundance last year, um, and uh, at Sundance, um, ended up uh, selling um, uh, the broadcast license to PBS with Independent Lens um, and a, an SPOT license to Netflix. Um, but we retained all of our other rights, including theatrical, um, you know, TV, educational, DVD, et cetera. And so we kind of knew that we, we were going to reach audiences um, in, in this really exciting way with our broadcast, which just happened about three weeks ago, and with Netflix Worldwide, which happened, I guess, two weeks ago. Um, but then we had all these other possibilities to kind of um, explore and figure out. Um, and so we had a pretty robust festival run and ended up taking the film to kind of do national premieres in, um, you know, in, in Denmark, um, where one of our stories takes place um, at CPH Docs, um, at Sheffield Doc Fest, Hot Docs, um, Melbourne, et cetera. Um, and, and really kind of audience building along the way. Um, and then, you know, always knew that the UK was a really important um, part of both the story of the film as well as um, our audience. Um, even you know, half of our audience we knew from our Facebook following and our email list was actually in the UK and half of it was in the US roughly. Um, and so that, that was significant. And, and so we knew we wanted to invest in doing a theatrical release there um, and brought in together films. Sarah's in the audience over there, hi Sarah. Um, and built the team with um, uh, based here in the US, uh, which we talk more about for our US theatrical release, which happened in September, UK in October. Um, and we also, um, you know, all along the way, we're also doing community screenings um, and decided really coming out of the festival run that we wanted to do an awards campaign, which was really, has, has proven to be really, really hard to do um, on one's own, but we were very fortunate to make the shortlist um, for the best feature documentary. Um, thank you. Uh, and so that's just like the big picture in a nutshell, and I look forward to kind of diving into sort of how we made all those winnowing decisions and also some of the tactics, which were really about engaging that audience that we had been had been carrying with us and thinking about how to how to grow it along the way. Great. Uh, Danielle, Julia, why don't you take us through the, the big picture for you guys? Okay. Um, so well, Columbus premiered at Sundance last year as well um, in the next section. And um, then we, uh, we, I think we always knew that we wanted to do a theatrical release for the movie because I don't know if you can tell from the trailer, but that was something that was very important to the director and also to the aesthetic of the film. I think it's a film that does very well on a big screen. So uh, when we started talking about the creative distribution, we knew we wanted to have a theatrical component. Uh, we started with a limited theatrical that was very small and ended up expanding, becoming more than 10 times bigger. Um, and then, um, about 30 days later, uh, we released the movie on iTunes on November 3rd. And then in December, it became available on Hulu. And I'll just say quickly, one of the unique things about this, this program, the creative distribution at uh, Fellowship at Sundance, which is, was brand new. I mean, we had this thing completely under wraps going into last year's festival. It's a very selective program in that not only does it have to be a film that, you know, and as you can see from the very moving trailers, that it has to sort of be in that curatorial uh, Sundance vein, but it also has to feature film teams that 
you know, showcase that lie on the tracks mentality because there's a lot of films that premiere here at Sundance and not all of them get the offers maybe they wanted to and nine and a half times out of 10, a filmmaker will take that deal because they're on to different things. They, you know, want the film to get out there and may not have the, the energy or stamina to do it. And both these film teams did, so I just want to, you know, make sure that that's something that you, I'm sure you'll see this current through each of them, but, uh, you know, Jen, Lindsay, Alyssa, talk, talk to us about Sundance a year ago. You guys sort of had hybrid and self-distribution in mind going into the festival, which is, which is rare among films. Yeah, we started thinking quite early on during production about how to reach our audience, given that the film's goals were really about impact. They're about bringing this story to very specific audiences in, in order to try and make change. And so by sort of summer last year, when we were sort of preparing for Catalyst, um, Sundance Catalyst, we had a sense of what we thought we could do um, in a sort of hybrid creative way. Alyssa and I had both done sort of creative distribution on previous films. <laughs> Um, and so we came in with a set of goals and a set of hopes that would enable us to reach all of these different audience categories in really specific ways. And it's the same that you were saying about not wanting to hand over a film to one company that might not love it as much as you do. And I think there are lots of great distributors and lots of them may do one or two things really well. And we wanted to do six or seven different streams of distribution really well and in a really specific, targeted, sensitive way particularly because with this topic, it's common for people to, um, or it was common for people to kind of misinterpret some of the details, which are actually really important. I think I just wanted to add, because hearing you guys talk about this makes me think, I think for Columbus, and Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for Columbus, this is sort of the geographical uh, distribution, like uh, Columbus is shot in Columbus, Indiana, and I think one of the things that was very important in our distribution, doing creative distribution, was uh, you know, targeting Indiana specifically, targeting Columbus, but targeting the Midwest as a bigger air, geographical area. And I feel like oftentimes, especially theatrically, when smaller independent films are released, uh, they are released maybe in LA, New York, like bigger markets that are by default kind of the cinephile. Um, places where people go to the movies to see these kind of theaters. And looking at our revenues is actually really impressive where uh, the movie made the most money because we went to places where probably the movie wouldn't have gone, but those are places where the movie did really well. So I think it's... And, and things, for example, and tell me if I'm going too far ahead, but, you know, we, we decided to forego a traditional um, premiere and typically those happen in LA and New York. And I think in the past, they've generated a lot of press and raised the awareness about the film. I think less and less that's happening now. But what we did instead is we partnered with an organization in Columbus, Indiana, and they hosted it. So for them, it was a huge win. They've never had celebrities come to their town, and John Cho came, and Haley Lou Richardson came. And for us, it was a real win-win because you know, there was a lot of love there. We were on the cover of the newspaper multiple times. You know, so, so that was one thing, too. I mean, that's an obvious thinking outside of the box. But, but we tried as much as possible to get creative because of this, this opportunity. But at the same time, we were, we were boxed in in certain windowing. So. Well, let, let's take a step back. And, and just so uh, folks are aware, part of this process was initially Sundance uh, through the fellowship giving each of these film teams grants, which sort of jump-started what is called p &A. It's an outmoded term, but it means print and advertising, basically marketing expenses. So whenever you hear the term p &A, it means how much did a distributor, or in this case, uh, these uh, producers, spend on print ads, the beautiful trailers that you saw, um, uh, DCPs that you send to movie theaters. So th these are real s I expenses and, you know, Sundance gave them a grant and we basically said, okay, well then let's sit down and really almost treat this as a, as a real-time lab-like experience. And in some ways, the fellowship is inspired by the, the Sundance labs up at the, up at the Sundance resort, but this is actually being done in real time. So now suddenly you're a distributor in a way 
and you have this money to spend and you have to figure out the most efficient and economical way to reach your audiences. So we'll talk to us about that process, which was basically probably March through August for, for both of you guys. Our team, um, so we knew that we wanted to have a really strong impact team, social impact team, and also distribution team. Um, and so it was a matter of Jen's production company bringing on some in-house uh, staff, an a director of impact worldwide, um, and then working that person working with other people in-house and also consultants overseas in the UK, in Australia. We had some um, incredible supporters who wanted to fuel the impact campaign um, worldwide. And then in terms of distribution, you know, we worked closely with Chris uh, and also drew on our existing relationships with publicists and um, to and, and other consultants to build a team. So, for example, Chris introduced us to Michael Tuckman, who's a theatrical booker and I think worked with Columbus too. And that turned out to be a good collaboration. He introduced us to Matt Delman, who I saw in the audience, who ran our digital marketing campaign with Jen and I um, and the UK team. And um, we hired publicists in New York, LA, San Francisco, the UK, maybe Australia for, no, not Australia. Um, I, I didn't follow Australia as closely as these guys did. Um, and who am I forgetting? I feel like there were so many. We had Film Sprout on our team, Caitlin Boyle, with Film Sprout to do grassroots community screenings. Um, and, and then just kind of ran the whole thing like a distributor would have. Um, and I think it's worth saying that when you do this kind of distribution, it isn't about doing it on your own. It's about building a team of everybody that a distributor may have, but building, the, building a team of the people that you choose who do it in really bespoke, sensitive ways. Um, so Sarah from Together Films, who did our UK theatrical distribution, um, you know, we were talking every day for five months. It wasn't that we handed everything over and it also wasn't that we did it by ourselves. It was really about building a bespoke team of people with incredible expertise in each of these areas and then pushing it all forward. And it wasn't easy and it was a it was a it was a balancing act. It was a tightrope walk a lot of times where it was challenging to figure out what to do first, second, third and fourth and how certain things depended on each other. Um, and the budget was still very tight. Um, and so, you know, it was, there were moments when we were just like, is this gonna work at all? Or how is this gonna work? Um, but I think it turned out pretty well in the end. And we, we were very nimble in adjusting to the, what, what was happening and getting, because there was transparency with numbers and whatnot too, we could adjust fairly quickly. You guys, you guys were in charge, you know. If, yeah. If you had sold your film to an all rights distributor, somebody in the United States who then controls all of those uh, different revenue streams, they decide when it goes in theaters and which theaters, they decide when it goes on iTunes, they decide when that SVOD start date happens, and you know, oftentimes you're, you're cut out of this process. So in this case, the filmmakers are making these decisions themselves, but you know, it, it still means that you can't do everything you want. For instance, you know, and, and Julia, we could talk a little bit about New York, the importance of New York for the theatrical premiere. I think in both cases, these films both premiered at the IFC Center, which is a really great theater in the, in the village in New York. And you gotta book those slots five months in advance in some cases. So, you know, t talk to us a little bit about the process. We give you a grant, we help figure out who's the audience and how do we reach them and who do we hire. You know, t talk to us a little bit about that process from, from March to August. I feel like, yeah, I feel like the one of the first things that came about was the possibility of opening theatrically in New York on August 4th at IFC Center. And that's something that we kind of had to jump on before we even were really ready to do it, honestly. Like, before we had enough uh, information, knowledge to really know whether that was good or not. I mean, it turned out to be great, but we kind of instinctively decided to go for it and um, and then we kind of built from there you know what does the theatrical release looks like and with your guys's help uh, we decided to do the landmark uh, release theatrical release which was originally 10 theaters with landmark um, and that sort of determined the rest of the release pattern for us in terms of windowing actually 
So that sort of uh, dictated uh, how much we had to wait before the movie could be on iTunes and how much we had to wait before the movie could then be on um, uh, Hulu or Netflix. On a, and, uh, and that's something Netflix. just we were not aware of. But certain theater chains, Landmark being one of them, the more prominent, if, you, if they play your movie, they say you may not show this in any digital form for 90 days. Or sometimes you, you, know, you get, there's also another window for SVOD. So you know, that was something that was new to us because we were thinking, oh, maybe we'll open LA and New York, a few other markets, get some press. A couple weeks later, put it on iTunes. So we're rolling the enthusiasm for the film into digital sales. And then we found out that was impossible. So there was a few things like that that happened along the way that, you know, if we were Magnolia or someone like that, like they would just know these things. Right. But I feel like we were learning as we're going. And the good thing is Chris and his team are putting together a written kind of breakdown of everything that happened that I think will come out in a few months. But, but you know, so many, so many things that we did not anticipate and costs that came up out of the blue and that kind of thing. So we were really, you know, learning as we were going. Yeah, one thing I will say is that, that I think is related to this, like we ended up using up the whole theatrical window. I mean, at the beginning, I think we were sort of like, well, what are we gonna do with three months in theaters? Like, we don't know if the movie is gonna stay. Uh, and actually the movie, I mean, we're, we just did the last theatrical showing before the end of the year. So it's been going really well in theaters. So, and I think that relates to budget as well. It's the thing that's really challenging, I think, is to when things then start going well and growing beyond your original plan, how do you manage with a very limited budget? And how do you move stuff around when there is very little to move around? Because <laughs> I think, you know, for us, that was a big challenge leading up to the theatrical, and it has been, you know, throughout up to now. Yeah, and, and just so you know, these guys, Columbus, did a million dollars at the theatrical box office, which is... 17,000. 17,000. <laughs> it's incredible. And, it, it, you know, I'm going to probably bore all of you here, but the, the, reven the revenue splits are such an important piece of this. And one of the uh, main motivations for filmmakers choosing to do a release like this is that an independent art house theater, on average, will take 65% of the box office. So you give them 10 bucks for a movie ticket, they keep 650 of that. So in a traditional distribution model, that $3.50 comes back to a distributor, then they take 30% immediately off that, then they recoup what they spent to buy the movie's rights, then they recoup what they spent to do the P&A, and then if you're lucky, there's a little bit of a trickle that comes back at the end. And so, you know, back to my earlier um, uh, uh, statement that these, these filmmakers really took the dice on themselves. Because in success, and Columbus's box office was, uh, I think, an incredible stat. Uh, there was a lot of films that premiered here a year ago that didn't do as well as I think a lot of people thought. So, you know, they're going to ultimately get 100% of that 35% of the million bucks. And... That's really, really something I think is important to know, uh, you know, for each of these, for each of these films. Um, and so unrest, you know, so much of this comes down to windowing. You know, Landmark was interested. Columbus is a movie that I think the team knew needed to have this, this theatrical release. That was the audience that they had identified, and they maximized it. You guys were a little bit different. You know, how did you figure out? when to do theatrical versus iTunes versus Netflix versus independent lens? Yeah. I mean, the short answer is we didn't really have a choice. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I, we, we also knew they wanted to do a theatrical release. And for us, it was really about press. Um, I, I, I haven't done the tabulation recently, but I think we probably got over like 300 pieces of, of, of coverage around like both theatrical releases and we're, you know, in the UK, we were on national, like, we're on the morning, the, the lunchtime, and then some other, like, like, like we're on, like, three national television shows, we're on, like, radio, we did every, you know, had, had features written in every major newspaper there and here, and, um, and so there, there was just, an at for, for the impact side of things, that was crucially important, because this, the, the, you know, a core um, purpose of the film was to 
really um, uh, start a, a conversation in the culture around this condition, around the stigma, around the way that women are disbelieved, um, and around the way that we tell stories about chronic illness and disability. And so we needed that press coverage to do that, which is why even if the theatrical was wildly unsuccessful, it was still, um, you know, I think worth it to us to raise awareness of the film and to be able to engage in those high-level conversations. Um, and, you know, and I think it's worth, I can talk about this briefly, but I think it's worth us chatting a little bit about how our experiences in the US and the UK differed. And um, I, one of the things that was sort of difficult for us is that we didn't have, um, you know, we, we, our film wasn't at Landmark, so we couldn't take advantage of a kind of, um, a, a national theater chain, which I think could have been um, helpful in terms of our rollout. And so we, we did do week long runs in New York and then that being the week plus in New York and LA and um, San Francisco and kind of smaller one off theatricals in um, other cities where we knew we had audiences. Um, but we were able to, um, we didn't have a very long window to um, really, you know, kind of let those, let the success of um, those one-offs grow into, you know, more bookings and a kind of wider release in the way that these guys did with, with the three months because we, we, because of our windowing, we had, you know, four months from our theatrical, we were going to be on Netflix. And so we had to kind of squeeze the theatrical, um, you know, the iTunes, the, the, the DVD and uh, the broadcast all within the sort of four month window. Um, and it, but in the UK, we had a very different experience and it was because the, the chain that we were working with there didn't have a requirement in terms of holdbacks on, on, on iTunes. You wanna talk about that a little bit? So um, our major partner was Picture House Cinemas and I've been working on them for a couple of years because we've been pitching the film for a very long time and I'd had good experiences releasing a previous film with them. Um, and so we started in the UK in October with a week of previews at the kind of major um, theatrical venues for documentary and for cinema like the BFI. And then we did a kind of UK premiere at Picture House Central, which is their major cinema in London. And then we did what was incredibly important in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same here. We, we did a tour with Jen and with special Q and A's with me, with patients and people from the film, but primarily with Jen and Omar, her husband, um, because that really is the way to get people into cinemas for films like this. And we had a combination of our core audience who were desperate to be there, um, some of whom couldn't be there because they were homebound or bedbound. And we found another way to do that, which Alyssa, I think, will mention. Um, but then we also had a new audience that we wanted to talk to. So that combination of talking to our community, which is something that Jen's been building for a long time and an incredibly difficult, time-consuming, complicated thing to do, um, alongside using the press to reach out to new people meant that we could do a tour across the UK in core independent venues connected to Picture House and then in other cities as well. So we really got to all the major cinema venues in, in the UK. How many cities is Picture House in, like 20? Um, it was 17 when we started, but it's, I think it's more now. Yeah, yeah so, so that just sort of allowed us with a, with a very short window, I think, to expand much bigger. And, and because we were able to eventize the one-off screenings, like I, I, I did do a tour in the US too, but the tour was between LA, San Francisco, and New York. And I actually flew to San Francisco, and then we got on the Today Show, and I had to fly back again, and then fly to LA for the LA premiere, whereas in the UK, it was just much easier to be able to actually go to all of these cities just because of the, the kind of physical plan of the country is so different. And so um, we were able, I think, to, in some ways, um, punch through nationally um, there in a way that was much harder to do here, and I think would have required an even larger team and an even bigger budget. So that was an interesting thing to kind of learn. Um, and if, if any, I just highly recommend releasing your film in the UK. It was really fun. Um, and People you know, never say that. <laughs> um, if, if you think you have an audience there for the film, it's a very different kind of cinema culture. And one thing very quickly to add is that because of the community that Jen had built, there are screenings that people create and host themselves at cinemas or other venues. So not only did we have this very intense tour when Jen was going around the country with the film and so were other members of the team, but also we had Q&As and special events hosted by people in the community who have this illness or who have family members who do. So it really allowed us to broaden um, that. And that takes a lot of work and organizing behind the scenes. And I think almost all of the events I was at sold out, but then all these events where there were other panels also sold out. And we ended up playing there in over 40 cinemas. And I think um, uh, the, the sort of, um, uh, the, uh, 
and, and again, I, I, I'm still not sure what was about how our timing was different there versus here versus sort of the markets being different, but our experience in the UK was very much the more and the more. Like we didn't have a day and date release, but even after we were on iTunes, and even after the film was widely available, people still wanted to go and have like social experiences of the film. And so we, had, we, we were getting more and more and more cinema bookings, even as we were online, as opposed to less and less. And so it ended up being, you know, I think we also ended up learning, or at least I did, I, I kind of thought that pristine windowing was like the most important thing in the world. I still don't, I don't believe in day and date, but I do think that, you know, the people who want to show up in a theater are different from the people who want to organize their own screenings or different from the people who want to watch it on their laptop um, from the people who want to watch it, uh, you know, during the broadcast moment. And so we found that having the film available in every way possible was really important because um, people's kind of consumption habits are still very different. And most people still have, you know, one way they want to see movies and they're totally different. You know, there's so many people who said, you know, I, I, how do I get, I, how do I get the computer on my, on my TV? Like, how do I get, like, they, they couldn't understand iTunes. And so they're really waiting for the DVD moment. Um, and that was a, I think, a really great learning experience. And just to clarify, day and date means putting a movie on a platform like iTunes the same day it premieres uh, in the theaters. And you know, and I think that actually brings up an important point, which is which is press, and how you guys are are using that press to, uh, uh, you know, message back to the audiences that you're building. You know, a lot of whom are on on social media. You know, something that really struck we we heard about this. Um, you know, prior to really getting involved in both films, but they're really, I think, it struck me with both of your films that there's a really codependent relationship, it seems, for theatrical distribution and press. So both of these film teams could have said, we're gonna put the movie on iTunes the same day it is released at the IFC Center in New York. And that might get your iTunes numbers up where you actually get 70% of the split rather than 35%. So that seems attractive, but you know there could be a trade-off in that you're not getting not necessarily reviews, but features written about your film press. I think both of these films have very interesting differentiators about it. It's not Columbus is not just a beautiful narrative feature. Unrest is not just a you know moving and, and probing and game-changing documentary. There's things about them that are this other that I think are human interest that the press still loves, and theatrical seems to be a big part of that. So maybe you guys can talk about how, what was the press strategy working with your publicists and how were you able to convert that press into ticket buyers? Uh, well, first of all, press um, in publicity is extremely expensive. If you're dealing with any of the top tier companies, which of course you want to work with. Um, so that was another learning experience for us that we ended up um, thinking, oh, we'll hire a publicist, we'll partner with them, and then actually, no, we need a team of three different publicists. We need a New York publicist, an LA publicist, and then we have one in Indiana. And if we had had a bigger budget, we would have done San Francisco, we would have done some of the other key markets. Um, I think um, the press was extremely helpful to getting people to the theater. We also, and we haven't really touched on this yet, but we did um, do geo-targeting on, on social media, like Facebook ads and that kind of thing. It, it, we will never know, you know how much that helped get people to the theaters, or, or maybe someone in Opera one day can figure it out for us. Um, but, but the press, at least on Columbus, was, was extremely helpful. I'm curious, Jen saying she's, she's anti-day and date, because I feel like for some movies that actually might be a great answer. I didn't feel like it was for Columbus. I think that there was something inherently cinematic about it, and it needed to have that more traditional rollout. Um, and then we were very fortunate because the, the press kept coming in and, and kind of it, it, it almost snowballed. Well, I think, I mean, one of the, I remember when we had our first strategy meeting and we were sort of going through, you know, putting down ideas, like who is the audience and all of those like big questions. One of the things we wrote down was that the audience for Columbus were people who paid attention to reviews. And part of that is, I think, because of our director as well, like he's uh, himself a film critic and he comes from film criticism. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a film, like a cinephile culture that he was very tapped in. And I think the film definitely speaks to a lot. So for this movie specifically, I think price was very important. It was very expensive. And I think ultimately 
probably very worth it. But I do think it's very specific to each movie. Like, I don't think it's a default that you need to do that. Like, I think there are other movies where you might be able to do something completely different, not have a publicist at all, and actually be extremely successful. Like, I think the, the thing, the biggest takeaway for me from this, it was thinking about, you know, your specific movie. Like, one thing that is right for a movie is not necessarily right for another one. And I think it's, you know, why creative distribution is interesting, because it allows you to go beyond sort of like a set path that distributors kind of are used to taking. And there's so many options now. And I think some of the films that we all expected last year would do gangbusters at the box office, some of them didn't. And I would argue that's because they were put through this, you know, system of, well, this is how we do it. And it wasn't actually tailored to that individual film and that film that film's audience. So that was something that, you know, we'll forever be grateful. We were able to think very specifically about this film and, and what to do. Dis the indie film distribution is, is probably one of the most hyper-specialized sectors in any business. And, you know, just to your point, like what might work for even a different documentary than, than Unrest would almost demand day and date. You know, what might work for, a, let's say, a, a you know, kind of raunchy comedy, maybe, you know, day and date versus a traditional theatrical. And I just say, yeah, I do remember when we had that whiteboard, people who respond to critics. I mean, Columbus, you all need to see it. It's on iTunes, it's on Hulu, it's in one theater, maybe. If you buy it, you get also a short film that Coco and Autumn made it. That's the only place you can see it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things about press and audiences, it, well, just f finding ways that you can, um, when you do know your audience, really, like Danielle was suggesting, deliver the press to them uh, through, through digital marketing, uh, through, in our case, um, organic sharing in the community. So really, um, once you get something, it, a, a good piece of press, then how are you, how are you helping um, that catch fire, you know, how are you helping that fuel what you're getting the butts and the seeds? Um, and we had like a strong, you know, we, we created a Time for Unrest Facebook group that was like not just fans of the film, but core supporters of the issue um, who were going to help us on the impact side and on, on distribution. And those people, if we say, look, here's an article, here's a social tile that has a pull quote, they would share organically and we could again geotarget that as well and say we're we're now coming to Tucson and you know wherever we were coming and be really specific about which press we thought would appeal to those communities. Now, now, and yeah. Well, I was just going to say, keep in mind this is all going on with these top-notch publicists. You know, we're doing geotargeted Facebook ads, but we are also on the phone calling professors at universities and really getting back to like very grassroots organizing you know like it's funny because I came from the world of documentary and I was that's what I did in my early days but we were trying to figure out who could be fans cold calling we had interns cold calling architecture professors you know you're hitting on all different levels uh, Danielle and Julia I wanted to ask about some of the nuts and bolts in terms of how you expanded theatrical because you know obviously there was very finite resources uh, you know Sundance was able to help pave the way in a lot of ways with the grant that helped fund the PA but it's not like we could just dip into our bank account and you know suddenly roll in funds how did you how did you figure out expansion versus cost versus yeah. that was really challenging because you know if you're a distributor and a film's performing, you have the option to up your um, up your budget on it. We had a finite amount of money through the grant, and all of a sudden, having a level of success and having more theaters ask for the film and wanting Koganata there to do Q and A's, in some ways, it's almost like getting into Sundance. It's like the best thing that ever happened to you, and then you say, "Oh my God, how are we going to actually facilitate this?" Um, we were very fortunate. We had someone who had invested in the film, who really loved the film, and, and um, gave an additional grant and gave miles. Like, I mean, we were, you know, like that's how we flew them around, and we got John Cho somewhere on someone's frequent flyer miles. I mean, and they were sleeping on 
couches and stuff like that. But that was something that hopefully will be outlined in the case study that Chris and his team are putting together. Um, you know, we initially talked to Michael Tuckman, who's a theatrical booker, who I love and forever will be grateful for. But I don't think he was used to working with people like us. He's used to working with companies who they can expand if things are going well. And we had finite resources. So when um, things get, or he would he would say to us, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this theater has a $350 charge and you have to buy an ad in the in the in their local newspaper. It's part of the contract. And so for him, it's like, people that he deals with always know that for us if we were like oh are you kidding me that's like another 500 bucks we don't have you know and where are we going to get it and it was extremely stressful i mean hopefully we will take that stress off of some of you if you're doing this because you'll you'll be able to look at our budget and actually see what things cost we had no budget to reference and i think the crazy thing is like julia and i really pride ourselves on being really responsible producers who are good with numbers who are good with you know problem solving and identifying costs and and it was just a whole other world you know it was like apples and oranges Guys, I'm getting the rap sign, but pay attention because f follow us on, on uh, social media, Sundance.org, because we're going to be releasing a lot more detail in a couple of months about all this. But please give a very warm hand to the unrest of Columbus.